Hidden hard, baby. There you go. Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Amplified and Intensified with your host, Eric Taylor, myself, Shiva Maharaj. We got Vince Bristler back with us today. What's going on, Vince? Yeah. Hey, Great to be back. A lot to say that even though it is going to be, we're recording this on Veterans Day, but it will be released tomorrow, right? Because this will be the Piss of Vinegar edition. So <laughs> post, happy Veterans Day to everybody that's out there. So. Happy Veteran Day, boys. I'm not a vet, but yeah. I believe both of you are. Yep, yep. Yeah. Eric is a retired, as a former Marine, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to start shoving crayons in your ears in a minute. <laughs> then you have less to eat. But anyway, so. <laughs> I love it. What do you think about the U.S. actions against ransomware events? I think it's great to finally be making progress. I mean, I think this is a long long-term effort that you're finally starting to see results from. It's like, how do you get law enforcement from, I think, what, what are they saying, 17 different countries to work mm -hmm. together to, to prosecute criminals? Um, you know, this is, this is the result of a lot of hard, slow, steady work from people in the law enforcement community over the last 10 years. Um, and it's, and it's good to see, it's good to see wins. It's good to see results. 10 years to get results. This is me being skeptical because I mean, I look at us fighting ransomware, meaning the U.S. government fighting ransomware, like how they fight narco trafficking. Yeah, I think, you know, I think when you, when you look at this from a law enforcement angle, like what law enforcement, law enforcement is not about stopping it, right? Law enforcement is about prosecuting. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge of like, how do you identify the actors? How do you collect the right information? How do you prosecute successfully? And how do you do that in an international construct? Like there's a lot of complexity and, and issues there, but when I, what we, what we're starting to see evidence of is people have started to figure this out. And I think, you know, as people start to figure this out, this becomes faster and better over time, but it's just, it's not an easy process in, from a bureaucracy standpoint. Yeah. The so one thing you say, this thing's been going for the last 10 years. Cause I was trying to find out if this is a, you know, not to get overly political, but something that we can actually credit Biden for doing something successfully, or is this a Trump or Obama thing that got kicked off? Look, I think in, in maybe 10 years is, is not enough, but I think if you go back to the Bush administration, even, you know, law enforcement has been trying to figure out how to solve these sorts of problems. I mean, it's, it's great for the FBI to say, Hey, I want to do something here. Um, but then how do you interact with international law enforcement, get people to, to behave, get governments to be involved. Um, and even in the U S you have, you know, the secret service, you have the FBI, you have Homeland security, you have NSA, you have cyber command, you have all of these different law enforcement entities that have to partner together to figure these things out. So, you know, we've been talking on the government side. I know when I was even, you know, back in my days at the white house, like people are trying to figure out how to solve these, these issues of how do you prosecute? How do you identify, how do you actually get these things to move forward? And so that's the, that's what I'm talking about in terms of the legacy here that we're starting to see take effect. Well, the reason I brought up narco trafficking is because I feel like there are parallels in how we would go after ransomware. They're out of the country. They cr generate enormous amounts of money that buys loyalty wherever they are. And they're in countries that are relatively inaccessible to our law enforcement because law enforcement is very different from military action as you're well aware yeah and in, in narco trafficking there's also this element of like just because you know who's doing it doesn't mean you're going to take them out because it's better to know who's doing it than who's not and wouldn't that be the same case for ransomware it very well could be i mean look if you when i looked at the with all the arrests that are happening for revil to me it just seems that a an intelligence agency or a good guy got into the Revil server and they were able to track and enumerate who the affiliates were, which is what led to the recent round of arrests. So wouldn't it have been better to have that keep going and really try to figure out as many affiliates as possible? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it depends on like, there's a, there's a lot of stuff written out here. And of course you go back to like Krebs wrote, wrote on this recently about a couple of these people that got popped. were just not very smart. Right. It's like using the same email addresses and passwords over time across forums. Like that's pretty easy to track somebody down. You get somebody with an intelligence background in Maltego 
password dumps and some other skills. And like, you can track these people down, okay. um, but it's the difference between kind of tracking down the individual and understanding the whole organization behind it is, is really tough. And that's where that's, you know, I think that's what law enforcement intelligence struggles with every day is like, how long do we maintain access to these to really figure out how do we cut the head off this beast versus how do we make some arrests? So, you know, in some ways you could say some of these arrests that have been made maybe showcases because it's like there's enough political pressure that you've got to show progress that you're going to make some arrests to put some heads on a stake and show progress. Well, I, I do think a lot of it is PR from our side saying, hey, we're taking action, we're doing something. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't think we've done anything yet that's going to change anything other than make potentially make the bad actors smarter and operate okay. more effectively, if that's even possible. I mean, here, here's another question is like stopping ransom, like really financially, who does stopping ransomware help? Like us, the businesses potentially, but insurance, right? Like the insurance industry is a big voice, right? And so I think a lot of this is, you know, how do, how do we figure out the insurance industry and the, and the, the, the money behind that world, right? That's they're they're suffering huge losses right now. We're seeing big changes in cyber insurance as a result of ransomware. I would have assumed that the insurance companies would be able to lobby to enforce better security measures as a baseline. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is I think, I think a lot of the, a lot of the movement we're getting on ransomware is driven by the insurance industry, right? Because they're suffering significant losses as a result of this. One of the big things I see in a lot of insurance applications or renewal forms, do you have EDR? And that's it. They just, they want you to have EDR but they don't want you to do anything with EDR. And I know far too many IT providers who love selling it to their clients, but they're not doing anything actionable with it. Yeah, I know a lot of folks in the cyber insurance world and, you know, there are a couple business drivers. You know, I think if you are, you know, big insurance company X, your products get sold through brokers, right? And you, so you have brokers that are, you know, turning product who are not necessarily technical. And so how do you push technical requirements through people that are not tech, tech people from a sales or integration configuration? The number I've heard is like a, a lot of these insurance companies will offer cybersecurity tools and products through their, their, um, offerings. And the uptake on those is like 5% because like nobody takes them up on these offers. And so I know a lot of people in this mar in the insurance industry are trying to figure out how do we move things forward? How do we do things differently? Um, I think they're smart enough that they're doing a ton of analytics around this and they're learning that, you know, things like two-factor authentication, education and training, backup, EDR, move the needle on the likelihood of a breach. Um, but it's still a long road to go to figure out how to get more, you know, more direct action against losses in that, in that industry. Okay. What's a dark cube doing, or have you guys been able to enumerate or figure out the C2 server addresses for? Ransomware? Um, we're doing a couple things on this line. You know, one is we're looking at different sources of, of reporting on it. Um, so, you know, things like Twitter, Twitter, uh, Twitter accounts that are posting this stuff in near real time. Like, how do we make sure we're tracking those and reviewing their results against false positives and, and blocking those, you know, looking for cobalt, stri cobalt strike servers that are you know, active in networks and, and, and finding and identifying those quickly. Um, we're in the process in the early stages now of kind of building out a, you know, a SOC and analyst capability on the back end with human analysts that are doing threat hunting. Um, so these are all driven by, you know, how do we identify ransomware? How do we get ahead of this curve? I would love to see real managed SOC in the channel or just in the industry because I've used a lot of them and they're not very good. It's just camp and I, alerts and that's what they're relying on. And I might, I mean, we may change our mind in a year, but I, I think for us, it's, there's, there's a blend between a managed SOC and people that are threat hunting in, in the data that we're seeing, right? So the ability to say, I can, I, I can look for beaconing. I can look for call outs on strange port. I can look for data kind of across the anonymized data that we're looking at. And so I can, I can threat hunt for these actors that, you know, may not have been discovered by other sources yet and block it. And so it's, it's in some ways it's a managed sock, okay. you know, on behalf of our customers, but it's not like, you know, you call us up and we help, you know, help remediate an incident. 
Well, no, I think that would be more the MDR, XDR Kool-Aid that everyone's selling or pitching these days. Um, For sure. I've I've just seen too many of the managed socks say, yeah, we'll we'll help you identify the issue and we'll notify you of it. And Mm -hmm. time and time again, I've come across people who use some of these managed socks and they get they go through their incident and they have to notify their managed sock. Hey, we got crypto, we got breached, we got hacked. And this is a day or two after everything hit the fan. Yeah. And the managed sock is like, oh, you didn't configure our product properly. Even though they said a few weeks before, yeah, we're seeing, we have full visibility. We got you covered. And yeah, we actually, we actually got the, uh, got a call about a week and a half ago from one of our customers that said, Hey, you know, we, we found an active, uh, compromise on one of our servers we've got cobalt strike like you guys didn't catch it um we dug into that incident and you know it was coming from a new ip that nobody knew of like nobody knew this ip was bad anywhere mm-hmm. and so what we we're able to do in that situation is say okay you flagged it as bad we're going to flag it as bad and all of our customers will be protected right and so the ability to scale that capability is, is pretty exciting so you know within a matter of you know seconds of of, of inputting that in there you know, anybody else, any of our other customers that saw that IP would have it detected and blocked. And that's fantastic because I don't think every SOC or every analyst can catch everything. I, I want to be clear, but I, I think, you know, we're, we're people, we're fallible. But the reason I bring this up, there's one managed SOC in this uh, channel and this client had, they got hit with wasted logger. So they had FireEye devices in there. They had, mm-hmm. um, Eric, not CrowdStrike, what's the other, uh, it's in, now, the other uh, AV product, Carbon Black. Yeah. They had managed Carbon Black, and they had a huge financial firm, so they had every toy a tech person could want. And this managed sock just missed it completely. Didn't even identify encryption, nothing well after the fact. So the fact that you guys are getting into it has me very excited. And if there's a list to be on for notification, let me know. You're on it. There we go. But to go talk about that a little bit, you, the one thing that we've always seen that just kind of, because I'm deep in this world, when you're, when you got threat hunters that are out there doing their job, you know, they're just posting out information, right? So it really would be good to, you know, have all that as a streamline, you know, it's much like, you know, we talk about being veterans and stuff like that. And, you know, the different departments don't really communicate. And this is the way that I really see a lot of this stuff where there's just no, uh, no communication or things compartmentalized inside, you know, their different roles. So, you know, it, it'd be good to see some of that stuff really f- flow through. Yeah. Do you guys plan on ingesting any data from any third parties? Yeah. I mean, we're already, you know, we're doing what we call signals-based threat intelligence, where we're monitoring a bunch of different sources out there. We're, we're doing an integration right now. Our, well, we already have an integration with Gray Noise, right, where their data gets in- incorporated into what we're doing and we're protecting our customers. We're looking to kind of advance that partnership in 2022, um, where you can start to get more Gray Noise detail out of, out of our platform. Um, uh, we're looking at partnerships with a, uh, a DNS partner, you know, how Which to one? incorporate uh that you can tell me yeah. offline if you, you don't can't say yeah yes um but like how do you incorporate dns into what we're doing you know get you know move beyond just the network layer and start to get passive and active dns um so you know that's 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 our future is like is around data integration and automation how has the move to work from anywhere changed uh your vision because you're no longer looking at just the firewall i assume yeah, I mean, I've always said, like, I think at some point in the in the not so distant future, firewalls go away as they exist today, right? Because people, you have this whole zero trust concept and you have endpoints that can be anywhere. And so, you know, spending a lot of time and money on protection when somebody is in one place at a temporal time and in, in space may not make a lot of sense. Um, and so for us, it's, you know, how do you monitor instrument and protect cloud infrastructures? How do you do that at the endpoint? Um, how do you do this all in a way that's kind of a, a single pane of glass and simple, right? I'd and like that's, to our, see, that's our approach. I'd like to see you guys uh, do that for a 365 tenant. Yep. That would we're, be oh. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one, that's one of the things we were just talking about this, you know, we're doing roadmap planning now, but like it drives me insane that like every, every time you see 
like an Office 365 tenant, not, I won't say every time, but pretty much every time you see an Office 365 tenant get hacked, you know, you, you run a PowerShell script, you pull down the logs and you're like, oh, I can see when the attack happened. Like it was on this day because here's a bunch of stuff from Nigeria and Lebanon and, and South Korea and other places that all of a sudden started logging into your tenant. You know, it's interesting that you brought that up. There is a managed stock provider in our channel as always. Mm -hmm. And everyone right now is doing Microsoft 365 log alerting. Okay. And the problem there is Microsoft tells you, listen, we won't even create a log for you to get actionable on for up to 24 hours. So yeah. you, you and I both know, and Eric, within five seconds, you can be completely owned. Yep. Actually, you know, what? I'm going to save this one for offline because I don't want to let it out of the bottle, but I'll give it to you guys for royalties or credits or just my name on the <laughs> label somewhere or a really good bottle of whiskey. Um, Got it. What do you think about the new civil action that the DOJ announced for false claims and holding IT providers to a higher standard or a culpability? Oh, this one rubs me in all the wrong spots. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I am. And I've been a part of a lot of discussions around it. I think, I think the intent behind it is interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to ever have anything like this have teeth. I think it's like, I look at the legal construct of like negligence and gross negligence, right? So, you know, where is that bar? And so I think it's, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think it's a pretty tough bar to say like, you know, marketing versus false advertising, right? And how do you really prove that out? I think it politically, it probably sounds good. Um, yeah. I think it's a really good press release, but the two things that most MSPs and anyone who's done a show or episode or, cause you know, everyone's podcasting now on this thing is it's civil. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which you have more rights in a civil procedure than you do anything else. So good luck getting that to stick. Secondly, buried down in the bottom of the article or the release is that the DOJ is limited by how many of these they can prosecute every year. So when yeah. you said civil, just to interrupt here, you talking about the DOJ will bring up civil charges versus federal criminal charges, right? Correct. Because I, I just want to make a clear distinction here because we have people that are, you know, creating podcasts and YouTube videos and LinkedIn videos are like, Oh my God, every MSP must comply with this. This has dick to do with the M MSP industry as a whole. Unless you're doing government contracts, it doesn't apply to you. Much like CMMC. Yeah, it's, everybody's like, oh, well, you must be CMMC. No, 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 you don't. Shut the F up. Vince, what are your thoughts on CMMC version 2.0? So the thing I loved and maybe someday will love again about CMMC is that it moves beyond simple app testation, right? Which gets back to false claims, right? When you say, you know, today as a government contractor, you're going to get asked, like, do you comply with NIST 800-171, right? And show me your SPRS score, um, around, you know, your, your level of compliance. And that's all self-driven. And there's a lot of interpretation, uh, that you can do. And so like, you know, to the best of my knowledge, this is true. Like, what does that really mean? Right? Like, yeah, you know, I'm, I've got endpoint because I have product X I've got like, you know, um, and so I think that whole world of self attestation around 800, 171 has created a very insecure supply chain. Yes. And I love the idea that. CMMC takes a step beyond that to say somebody actually has to come in an independent party has to come in and look at what you're doing and validate that you're actually doing it the right way. I hate the business constructs around that where it's expensive, it's pay to play, mm -hmm. kind of all of that noise that came into CMMC that I think made people revisit it. Um, and then CMMC too kind of takes a step back and says, well, you know, we're going to kind of go back to the self attestation piece for most people. Maybe for some of these more critical contracts, we'll do an assessment. I think it's, I think ultimately it'll be a decent bridge into something more mature. I think it, it's a, it's a way for the DOD to, to say, look, we embrace the idea that we have to do better than 800-171, but it's going to take a long time to get there. Um, well, the rollout for CMMC two, isn't that about two to three years now? 
Yeah. I mean, and it's not even going to be incorporated into most contracts, right? So it's like it, it, again, it's rather than being a bridge to the future, it's a piece of plywood that's dropped over the, over the water that you're kind of limping across. Um, you yeah, this is, if I can interrupt, this really rubs me in, I, I guess it's going to be my phrase today is rubs me in all the wrong spots, but you know, when you're going and trying to get a government contract, like you said, the, you know, you say you're 800, 171 compliant, here's your score of your self assertion and everybody's complaining that, oh, we couldn't get to CMMC because it's going to take a metric F ton of work to do. But now that they've rolled that thing back and say, okay, well, your middle road, you know, AKA level old level three is now full implementation of 800, 171. They're still complaining that it's going to take a long time before they can actually do this. So, you know, to your, what you said, the supply chain is goes severely out of whack. Yeah. I want to take it one step a little further. Do you see something for the public sector to the effect of for us to reissue you a business license going into 2022, you must comply to this or for you to have an insurance policy, you must comply to this. I know insurance is doing a little bit with, you know, do you have MFA? Do you have this? You have that, but actually creating some sort of framework or adopting like CIS controls to say, to do business, this is what you need to do. Are you seeing any of that in the back end chatter? Cause I'd really love to see something like that. No, I don't think anything like that'll happen anytime soon. I think the only thing that's going to drive adoption, like there, I think there are two things that drive adoption of standards like that. I think one is, you know, when you get into regulated industries, right? So, you know, if, if you have a regulatory body, critical infrastructure, those sorts of things where you can, you can apply more force. Um, I do think probably the primary agent for change in terms of security postures going forward is going to be cyber insurance. I mean, we're already seeing, um, if you're renewing your policy now, it's getting a heck of a lot more difficult to renew it. It's getting a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, I think, I think insurance will be the major driver for security postures going. I have a question, you know, I loved the idea of CMMC, the first iteration or the non version two, but this is uh, my gripe with it. Where are the C3 PAOs? I never thought that was a good idea. I never, and I've said this over and over. Why wasn't it for the DOD by the DOD? Why can't they audit their contractors? Why go outside? I, I think people would be much more afraid of falling afoul of the CMJ than they would federal laws because then they could be prosecuted again. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if, you know, a lot of what CMMC is focused on is protecting procurement data, financial data, confidentially, confidential, but unclassified information. Like we're at a different stage than we were five years ago in terms of the IT systems that are available, you know, remote desktop, DDI infrastructure. You look at what Microsoft has launched, like, you know. I, I think there's one course of action that basically says, why doesn't the DOD, like for any contractor that has to interact with that information, the DOD will host desktops for people to come into, right? And so you have your zero trust environments with remote access, and that's where that data gets stored and it never leaves the purview of the DOD. Like these sorts of things are possible now where five- That just makes so much really sense. Hard. Why would yeah, they ever do that? I mean, <laughs> you know, give everybody a shot at having China, Russia, or anyone else come in and take the data. Yeah, I mean, if I were, if I were in the DOD and we're king for a day, I mean, my push would be to do like, we're going to work, we're, we're going to house, we're going to have our own infrastructure to house data where people can interact with it, or we can, or we can come and hit your infrastructure, right? We can assess your infrastructure. So if you're, you know, a, a Lockheed or a Northrop Grumman or a Boeing, you can host an infrastructure like that too, but it has to become under our purview. And so now Boeing can host an infrastructure like that for all of its subcontractors, for its contracts and be responsible for its data. I'm going to ask a question here and it may be classified or what have you. So feel free to tell me to shut up. Didn't we, did not the U.S. government used to do something like that back in the sixties and the seventies? Obviously they didn't have the technology they had today, but the DOD had more control over their subcontractors and their security. I think I'm, and I'm thinking more of skunk works. 
I, I don't know. Um, I feel I was, like, no, sorry, good. No, I just feel like we've, the DOD has given their subcontractors more leeway every year as the years have gone by. Yeah. And it's less of that tight grip that they may have had during the cold war. Yeah. And a lot of this information isn't necessarily sensitive, right? Like, I mean, to me, it's like what data is sensitive and what do we care about and what do we not? And like, are you really going to, you know, say, say a government contractor is that that's doing like running program management or PR for a public program where there's no sensitive data. Are you really going to make them pay $50,000 for a security audit when none of that data is sensitive? Right. And so I think that's where the risk management comes into all this, and which you start to see an example of that with CMMCB too, right? It's like, okay, we're going to let some people sell a test and we're going to, we got rid of two of the five levels because it didn't really make sense to have five levels anyways. Cause I do agree with that. I always thought it be used. I always thought it should have been three levels that two were just a push on the way to the next level. Yeah. But what I liked was that independent audit. And uh, yeah. uh, to me, it's just out the window. So, yeah. And I think they've bookmarked the ability to go back to that over time. But for now, it's like, we're not going to figure this out in two years and we've got to give acquisition folks the ability to, to incorporate some of this if they need to, right? Which is what we see here. Makes sense. Yeah, we've always been, especially Shiva and I have been on the bandwagon of, you know, they need to, somebody needs to start doing something now, which, so I'm glad that something is being done to some degree, but it's a wooden plank. Yeah. I just, it's just not far enough. You know, I was going through level three CMMC internally, um, just because I didn't know exactly where this company is really going to end up in the next three years. So I was like, well, at least, at least have that as a paved road to go down or a gravel road, and then we can pave it right type thing. So now it's like, well, crap, <laughs> you know, now what I, so, you know, I'm pivoting to CIS controls. Cause I think when I compare apples to apples, I think CIS controls has a lot more granularity and a lot more yeah, complexity to it than just the 800 So one of the things, yeah, just, uh, sorry, dad. I was going to say just being like throwing ideas out there. Like, you know, when you fill out your tax return, like everybody's tax return doesn't get audited, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do your own tax return. You're self-attesting to your income, but there's an audit agency that can come back and audit you at any point, which keeps people honest. Right. And so like, that's, that's another feature that I would love to see, you know, let, let people go to the self attestation route, but have a, have an arm in the DOD that comes back around and says, okay, we're going to go through the, the self-assessment that you did. And we're going to validate that you did it the right way. And if you get it wrong, there's a severe penalty, right? So there are, there are other ways to think about how do you enforce security in ways that, you know, maybe lighter weight. And so I always love that IRS model when you have programs that are expensive and complex, but you need people to be honest. What's your favorite security compliance you said? Uh, I don't like any of them per se. Great. Um, Can we build our own? <laughs> I, I think the problem with like, I think the problem in general is when you have a compliance framework, it gets handed to compliance people, right? And so you have compliance and you have security and they end up being two different disciplines. I always, I, I always say like, if you need a framework to go to, like NIST CSF is a great one to start with, like, because what, a, what a compliance framework gets you is a way to start thinking about security in a, in a methodical way. And in, in that aspect, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, but I think what's more important to me is like, how do you implement risk-based security based on your, your own organization, which is where compliance frameworks don't necessarily come into play, right? It's, it's kind of hard to, to marry those two. I think they're necessary, but not sufficient. I think compliance is just a waste of time. I'd rather focus on security, but what do I know? But how you go? Nobody knows what security means, right? You have yeah. to have some sort of impartial framework to hold it up against. No, that I agree with, but I just, I, I don't think, I think we're in agreement <laughs> potentially that compliance sets don't really do anything to push forward security. It, it may start you down that road, but it doesn't actually yeah. enforce security. So that's yeah. my issue with it, with compliance at least. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we definitely just got to do something. I just don't know what it is. Well, one of the things that Vince said the last time he was on was if he were still in charge anywhere in the government, he would 
fail faster. And I feel like that's what we need to go back to, right? It's things are moving too slowly and the threats are moving a lot faster than we can keep up with. So here's an interesting thing, because you said a minute ago when you were talking about the DOJ and the, them coming up potentially civil, uh, suits against people who are, you know, defying or misleading their cybersecurity posture to clients. Well, no, it's but, false claims acts against people who have DOD contracts or federal contracts. Like that's what this entire DOJ initiative is. It's not URI servicing Joe Schmo down the block. Yeah. And but that's, sorry, good. You mentioned in that conversation though, that they're only going to be able to, you know, handle so many cases. No, I don't think it's a matter of handling it. I believe there is a statutory limit as to how many of those cases they can prosecute a year. But do you think that's due to bandwidth? I mean, Vince, you came from the uh, government circle. If they want more bandwidth, they can get it, right? They can, but again, it all goes back to, you know, law enforcement all goes back to successful prosecution, right? Like for for the FBI or any law enforcement organization to take up a case, they need to feel comfortable that they can successfully prosecute. Yeah. Right? And if they don't have the information or detail to do it, they won't. Right. Um, I think if you look at the timing of that, I think it came out, was it this Monday that it came out? I think so. It came out one business day after the CMMC V2. So I think it's maybe what you were talking about with the IRS structure of them saying, okay, go ahead and self-attest, but here are the civil penalties if you don't do what you say you're going to do. So maybe that's their two-pronged approach for now. It could be. But hey, what do I know? So. Definitely something we're going to keep an eye on. So. Anything else you want to go over, Vince? No, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're certainly at an interesting time. We started this discussion around kind of the ransomware, the ransomware piece, you know, clawing back money, identifying people in these networks. Um, you know, I think, you know, going forward, we, we've seen indications this year of, of, of some good supply chain attacks, right. With solar winds and Kaseya. And I think we're only going to see more. Um, and I think that's where, you know, I'm hopeful from an international standpoint that these law enforcement agencies are really starting to work together to figure this out, but then as soon as you have nation states involved in these things, it becomes tricky. Well, if you look at all the recent arrests, it's the same countries that they're working with over and over and arresting these people, Korea, Ukraine, or where most of the arrests seem to be happening. So, wow, you've made it to yet an end of another episode. If anything resonated with you with Vince or anything resonated with you that Shiv or I have spoke about, and you want to know more, please go down into the description of the podcast and check us out open up a lot of communication. We'd love to have a conversation with you and please share this content with somebody that you think will enjoy it. We're really trying to grow this thing out. And with that, we appreciate it. Take care.